This webinar is designed to help small businesses understand the basics of how to do business with federal agencies. It's all about helping established businesses win federal contracts. Welcome to the Florida Procurement Technical Assistance Center's Overview of Contracting with the Federal Government. The goal of this webinar is to provide you a firm foundation for your first meeting with your local PTAC so that the first meeting and the ongoing discussions with your PTAC specialist are as productive as they can be for you and ultimately lead to your business's growth and success. There are certain things you will and won't get from this webinar. We will be addressing many questions and topics that you should be considering before jumping into this new market. But I won't be able to give you the answers because the answers are dependent on your particular business situation. However, I will be sharing best industry practices that have been used by those who have gone before you and have succeeded. I will also be sharing with you some of the most used tools and resources that will help you get started on the right foot. First, a little bit about the program. The Procurement Technical Assistance Center Program, or PTAC, was authorized by Congress in 1985 in an effort to expand the number of businesses capable of participating in the government marketplace. It's administered by the Department of Defense, Defense Logistics Agency, or DLA. The program provides matching funds through cooperative agreements with state and local governments and nonprofit organizations as well. There are 94 Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, or PTACs, across the country, with over 300 local offices nationwide. Here in Florida, government contracting specialists provide support across the entire state. So there's always a PTAC specialist near you. The PTAC program not only supports federal government contracting, but also state and local government contracting assistance as well, in three basic ways, by providing educational services, such as the webinar that you're viewing today, information services to include contract research and technical information, and one-on-one -on -one confidential consulting services, where you can sit down with a government contracting specialist to talk about the details of your business. Specifically, some of the things that we provide include assistance with contracting laws, policies, and procedures, assistance with registrations to include the system for award management, help with the Metro Protege programs, the DLA Internet Bid Board System, or DIBS, and assistance in securing preferred small business certifications, to name a few. Let's get started. This presentation today follows the Florida six-step gateway process to government contracts. We'll start off by looking at some good techniques to evaluate this market to see if it's suitable for your business. And then moving forward, we'll look at some good solid ways to plan out your approach from getting you where you are today to your next government customer. We'll look at some mandatory registrations that every government vendor must have in order to do business in the federal sector. We'll look at some good preparation techniques to help you optimize your chances for success. We'll also look at actually pursuing opportunities, and this is what most people would think of in terms of developing a proposal, submitting it to the government for evaluation, and ultimately being awarded a contract or achieving that positive result. So let's start off by looking at some good techniques for evaluating the federal government marketplace, if it's right for you, and where you fit in. So a good place to start is where you're at today, and that's by attending a workshop. But there's no reason to stop with today's workshop. We would encourage you to continue by looking at other available online webinars, training programs, and opportunities to learn more about the federal government arena. There are excellent training programs available through the SBA or Small Business Administration classroom on their website at sba.gov. 
Also, through the National Aptech Association, there are a number of events and sites and training opportunities that are available there as well. Also, it's always a good idea to attend a vendor orientation. Most government agencies will have a periodic orientation for new vendors that can learn about how to do business with that agency, when solicitations are released, how to become aware of those solicitations, and what are the upcoming contracts that are going to be issued by that agency. And again, we are at the evaluation stage of this process. However, it is a good way to start getting immersion into doing work with various agencies. We also recommend forging a relationship with a business advisor. We would hope that that would be with a PTAC specialist. However, there are a number of business advisors that are available to you to assist you, to include the SBA, the Small Business Development Center, or SBDC, and SCORE, to name a few. One of the things that we recommend very early on, especially in the evaluation stage, is to take a look at a solicitation. Now, solicitations are called many different things. They could be called a ITB or invitation to bid, which is generally associated with a firm fixed price contract or usually a construction contract. RFQs, which are request for quotes or request for qualifications. RFP or request for proposal. Or ITN, invitation to negotiate. Regardless of what the solicitation is called, it can only benefit you to take a look at either current solicitations or solicitations that have been recently released. The idea here is to become aware of what's going to be required of you to bid on projects, submit your offers, and ultimately win a contract. Now, I will say that If you're new to this, if you've never looked at a solicitation, keep in mind the purpose of doing this at this point is to just become familiar with what the requirements are. We're not producing a proposal. We're not responding to an opportunity. We are simply trying to gain an understanding of how to operate in this new marketplace. So the point is that it will be overwhelming at first. There'll be many terms, acronyms that you may be unfamiliar with, and that's okay. You can turn to your PTAC specialist to help provide clarification and clarity on what those terms mean and how to read through a solicitation. The first solicitation you may download may be sizable. It may be 500 pages or more. Keep in mind that there's many solicitations. All solicitations are not created equal. If the first one that you download will take several reams of paper and multiple volumes, keep looking. Solicitations can range from 500 pages to 50 pages and very short five-page solicitations. So keep looking, gather your questions, and you want to bring those questions to your first meeting with your PTAC specialist. So where do you find these solicitations? A good place to look is at the federal procurement site beta.sam.gov. I would encourage you to visit that site. Initially, look under the area that says contract opportunities. And under the keyword search section, enter keywords that are associated with what you do. And again, it does not have to be an exact match to what you do. We're only trying to garner a basic familiarity with how the federal government works. So, for example, if you provide lawn care services, try putting in landscaping or mowing or grass cutting. That's probably going to get you pretty close to where you're going to end up being in looking for opportunities, download a solicitation, print it out, take a look at it. So one of the things that is a 
mandatory requirement of all federal government contractors is to have a familiarity with federal government acquisition regulations. It is a highly regulated environment and marketplace, and having a basic understanding of what is going to be required of you is imperative. Now, this could include an understanding of CFRs or Code of Federal Regulations. You'll often see references to what is called the FAR or Federal Acquisition Regulations. And many times, even individual agencies such as the Department of Defense will have supplemental agency regulations. And then it moves downstream from there to include services and individual commands. Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to be an expert in all the details and have a lawyerly understanding of every possible granular detail. However, what we recommend is to have a familiarity with it. So a good comparison is accounting. As small business owners, we need to know a lot of things, but we can't be experts on everything. Accounting oftentimes is one of those subject areas. So being able to read a profit and loss statement, having an understanding of how to understand the overall financial condition and health of your company is, is important. However, we do not need to be certified public accountants. We hire experts for that. The understanding of federal government acquisition regulations is very much the same. It's important to have a basic understanding of it, to understand when certain subjects are, are beyond your current knowledge and who you can turn to for clarification and more in-depth understanding. Oftentimes, that, those clarifications and that understanding will start with your PTAC specialist and then many times will lead to an attorney who specializes in federal government acquisitions. Your PTAC can help connect you with all those resources. So that's the first initial steps in evaluating this new market, some good uh, first things to do. And then moving forward from that point, it's a good idea to start assembling a plan. Now, I'm not going to be addressing the mechanics of how to assemble a marketing plan. There's plenty of information available on how to do that. However, I will be addressing what I think are some of the more important components that you should be capturing in your marketing plan for federal government contracting. One of the first things to consider when drafting your plan is to have an awareness of the different levels that federal agencies make purchases at, the different thresholds. So for example, at the micro threshold, which is typically a credit card purchase or sometimes called a P card purchase, the government can make a credit card purchase if the individual is authorized for up to $10,000. Many federal government acquisitions and purchases fall into this category. From there, there's a mid-level purchase, which is oftentimes referred to as a Simplified Acquisition Procedure, or SAP. That's above the micro-purchase threshold of $10,000, up to $250,000. The key point about SAP purchases is that most of them are reserved for small businesses. And then finally, moving up to the largest level of purchase, or a large purchase, are any acquisitions that are above $250,000 up into the billions of dollars. These are usually procured through betasam.gov or GSA. Typically, they will take the form of an invitation for bid or a request for proposal, or RFP. The point is that in your marketing plan for doing business with federal agencies, it's important to consider targeting, to being focused on perhaps a certain section or a certain threshold of purchases. Now, that doesn't mean that your business has to stay at that level forever and ever. However, 
you need to find a place to get a viable foothold and to win that first contract. Oftentimes, at the micro or SAP level, that's where many small businesses will find their first contracts. And then from there, going up the ladder and growing as they build past performance and more experience in doing work with federal agencies. So where can you find information and develop better insight for your government marketing plan? Well, by doing your legwork, by doing your due diligence. And a good place to start is by looking at past contracts. Now, it's important to note that over 90% of all federal contracts are cyclical. In other words, they repeat. So taking our example of landscaping services, if a federal installation needed landscaping services or groundskeeping services last year, they will need them again this year. And that good old grass keeps growing, they'll need it again next year. So by looking at past contracts, who those contracts have been awarded to, how much was that contract awarded for, and when is it coming up for recompete, will provide good information, good intel, and will help you focus your marketing plan on your next government customer. A good place to look for that information is at a site called usaspending.gov. And that contains all past contracts that have been issued by the federal government. A good place to look for present opportunities is by looking on the site that we've already visited and looked at, and that's betasam.gov. That site provides a listing of all active act acquisitions in various stages, and that's where you're going to be able to find what's currently available and what's currently being recompeted. And then finally, in doing your due diligence, look at future acquisitions. Many agencies will publish any future acquisition opportunities that they are anticipating. Now, Agencies do the best they can. They do not put out acquisition forecasts for small purchasing amounts such as micro purchases. What you'll typically see in those acquisition forecasts are generally the larger contract activities. However, it still will provide some information about what's going to be coming up over the next year to two years. So these are all good things that you can do to develop a familiarity with the market, to develop uh, uh, an idea of where to focus your energies and efforts, and what agencies are buying what you provide. So in identifying your market and finding your target, what we're trying to do here is find the agencies that are purchasing what we offer and we're trying to find viable opportunities, winnable opportunities. Now, there are all uh, different kinds of ways here in narrowing this definition. This is just a few. But something to consider is maybe a focus on the sector of government that you're interested in. First of all, there's, there's two big divisions in federal contracting. There's civilian agencies, such as... NASA, uh, CDC, and then there are Department of Defense agencies, such as the Navy, the Air Force, the Army. So that is one of the first big segmentations in the federal market. And then from there, focusing in on perhaps a location. Do you want to look at contracts that are in your regional area? Perhaps you want to look at contracts that are within driving distance. Here in Florida, we typically uh, are ranked as number five in the country with the number of contracts and amount of federal spending. So it is an opportunity-rich market in Florida. Many small businesses in getting their start in government contracting find it difficult to service and support a contract that is two time zones away. It's much more convenient to be 
in the same basic location and close to their headquarters that can be more efficient in delivering the operations in support of the contract. It's something to consider. Every small business is going to be different. There'll be different circumstances depending on the conditions of your business. But something to consider is the location of the contract. And then, of course, always important to consider the requirements of the contract. What are the functions of the contract? What is the agency looking for? But not only just the, the uh, products or services, but there may also be bonding and insurance requirements or maybe licensing, things of that nature. So where do you find the answers to these questions? By going back to our practice solicitation that we downloaded in the very early stages of this presentation, many of the answers to the questions that you're going to be generating here are going to be found back in that solicitation. And again, your PTAC specialist can help you to rapidly find those indicators of requirements in the contract so that you can, again, position yourself for success as we move into the later stages of business development. So moving forward, we've evaluated, we've said, yes, this is something that we're interested in. We've got a good, uh, solid game plan that gives us uh, some areas to focus on. There's some mandatory registrations that are going to be required of us in order to get into this market. Let's take a closer look at what those are. So for starters, before you can start in government contracting, you're going to need to start a business. Now, that's one of the areas that uh, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center program uh, does not typically support. However, there are a number of resource partners through the Small Business Administration who can help you with that to include the SBDC, the Service Corps of Retired Executives, or SCORE, the Women's Business Center, or WBC, and the Veterans Business Outreach Centers, or VBOC. Now, these are no-cost public service resources and experts who can help you start your business. If you would prefer to have a dedicated for-fee professional who is going to help you with that, I would encourage you to take a look at the Small Business Resource Network, or SBRN. That is a network, a referral network, of professionals who not only help businesses get started, but other expertise and resources as well to include attorneys, accountants, and financial assistance. You can visit that site at sbrn.org. So we're going to assume that you've started your business and we are ready to go with our government contracting regulations. One of the first things that you're going to need to do is to look up your business codes. Now, there's two primary codes that you're going to encounter in federal contracting, and those are the North American Industry Classification System, or NAICS codes. The other one is the Product and Service Codes, or PSCs. This is also referred to sometimes as Federal Supply Codes, or FSCs. Although they're different coding systems, the same basic theory is the same between all coding systems for the, for the government. And that is they are a numerical classification with a product or service. So in other words, the best way for me to explain this is by providing an example. So if you provide lawn care services, we'll stay with that example here, what do you call that? If you're a government agency and you want to advertise that you have that requirement, what do you call that? Will you call it mowing, grass, cut, grass cutting, landscaping? Do you get out the thesaurus and look up every possible word associated with that activity? Well, that's not an efficient way for the government to conduct 
its acquisition activities. It's not an efficient way for agencies and businesses to connect with one another. So the solution is to assign each each type of product or each type of service a code. And that's the way that the government classifies that purchasing activity, that expenditure, it's 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 line item and its budget. It's the way that it advertised that opportunity. You'll see opportunities advertised on betasam.gov that are organized by their NAICS codes. It's also a way that uh, vendors can quickly find those opportunities and also identify themselves by what functional areas that they support. Many times when you first talk with a government contracting professional, one of the first things they will ask you is, what are your NAICS codes or what is your NAICS code? And you can have multiples. It doesn't mean that you have to have one. For example, construction companies will oftentimes have numerous NAICS codes. They will, of course, have their primary NAICS code under the construction activity, but they also will provide roofing services, HVAC maintenance, plumbing, electrical services, and each one of those is a different NAICS code. Other companies will just have one primary NAICS code, and that's it. It doesn't mean that more is better. It just means that that identifies what your company does and how it can support federal agencies. Very important concept to understand, the basis of the different coding systems. So now you've, ident- you've started your business, you have your business established, you've identified what your uh, associated codes are with your business, you're going to need to complete your Dun & Bradstreet DUNS registration or Data Universal numbering system. This is a free registration that's available to all government contractors. By visiting the website on the screen, what you'll do is once you arrive at the site, it will ask you to input your company name and location, and it's going to query the site to see if you're already registered and have already been issued a DUNS number. If you haven't, then it provides the option to go ahead and apply for a DUNS number. It's, it's a uh, short five-step process. You'll go ahead and submit your information. It generally takes about 20 to 30 minutes to complete the registration request. And then usually takes a few days uh, for Dun & Bradstreet to issue you your DUNS number. Once you have your DUNS number, then as a, as a contractor who wants to do business with the federal government, you're ready to move on to the next step. And that's going to be completion of what they call your SAM registration or System for Award Management. That can be found at www.sam.gov. Now, although the two um, sites are identified um, with the same acronym SAM. Earlier I had referred to betasam.gov and this one is sam.gov. The federal procurement system is going has been going through a consolidation over the last few years and they're starting to merge multiple legacy systems together into one unified procurement system. So currently, that is in transition. So uh, as it stands today, those two sites are operating very closely with one another, but they have not been fully integrated at this point in time. So the point is that the two are associated with one another. They're, however, they are uh, separate from one another, one another at this point. So very similar in the name, the same name, Sam, but two different sites. One provides, uh, Betasam provides uh, your information for acquisitions and contract opportunities. This particular site or www.sam.gov is where you need to go to register your company in order to move forward in doing work with various 
federal agencies. I would Once you arrive there, there's going to be several things that you're going to need to do. The first one is to establish a username and password. And you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner uh, an option for um, uh, proceeding forward with that step. Also, under the help section, I would encourage you to take a look there as well. There are some helpful how-to step-by-step videos that are available to you that walk you through the process. Many PTAC clients will utilize our services to help them complete the registration step. So if that's something that you need assistance with, please engage with your local PTAC, give them a call, set an appointment, and they would be happy to assist you in, in the successful completion of your SAM registration. As you're going through your SAM registration, towards the very end, if you choose to do this yourself or with your PTAC specialist, towards the very end, the second to last screen, you're going to be presented with the option to complete your SBA Dynamic Small Business Search Profile. Very important that you click on that option, and that will open up a separate window you're going to want to complete that. And again, this is part of your SAM registration process. Towards the very, very end, you're going to go ahead and click on that option, and that is going to enable you to uh, fill out your complete profile for uh, your business. That profile is going to be available to government purchasing professionals, prime contractors that are looking for subcontractors, and any other small businesses that are looking to possibly team. So we encourage you to um, go ahead, take advantage of that option, visit that site, complete the profile uh, and as, as, uh, uh, as fully as you possibly can. Uh, it's something that you can always go back in and alter, refine, uh, polish it as your business changes. Of course, that, that information should be updated on a regular basis as well. But essentially, the SBA Dynamic Small Business Search, or what is uh, commonly referred to as DSBS, it's essentially the search engine for the government in finding small businesses. And again, I'll uh, harken back to one of the topics I addressed earlier, and that was with the different thresholds of buying. And under the SAP purchase or the mid-level purchase, all those purchases are reserved for small businesses for the most part. So oftentimes an agency will go to this database, the dynamic small business search, in doing their contract research, in uh, determining are there enough small businesses out there capable of um, providing the required products and services that that agency is needing. So this is usually one of the um, uh, well-used research uh, tools uh, that are used by government buyers and decision makers. So you want your profile to be as polished as it can possibly be. Again. Your PTAC specialist is very familiar with, with uh, this requirement, very familiar with that database, and has seen a lot of companies who have registered and understands how to help you polish that profile of your company. So now we've completed our basic registrations for doing business with federal government agencies. What are some things that we can do to prepare ourselves to really increase our chances of winning that first contract. Let's take a closer look. First of all, by developing some good, solid marketing tools. Now, there, there's not one set of marketing tools that is a one-size-fits-all for everyone. This is going to be different depending on your business, your market sector, whether you provide services or products or or uh, what type of agencies you're focused on, whether those are civilian agencies or DOD agencies. Uh, all the things that we referred to earlier are going to 
become important here in developing your marketing tools, and they're going to help you develop a, a focus in your messages. So some of the things that we ask you to consider uh, include a, a, a good solid business card that is focused on your government customer. One of the things that uh, I like to do is I like to put my NAICS codes on the back of my business card, perhaps along with my Dun and Bradstreet Duns number and any small business certifications that I may have. And I like to, when I hand that business card to a government decision maker, I like to show them the back of the card first because I'm speaking their language and immediately I'm communicating to them by having those various codes in there that I'm in the government market field and I understand their language because that's the way that, that government procurement professionals speak is in acronyms and codes. And so by capturing that, not only on my business card, but on my other marketing materials, I'm communicating to that customer that I have got my uh, registrations in place, that I have got all my tools in order, and I am ready to do business with their agency. I also recommend creating a page on your website that focuses on government. Now, I'm not suggesting that you completely revamp your website. What I am suggesting is you may want to create a separate page or tab that refers just to the government. And the reason being that the government views themselves as being different. And rightly so, they are different. It's a different type of buying activity. It's a much more rigorous kind of transaction. It's very regulated. There's different ways that the government buys. And by having a separate tab on your website, you're immediately communicating to that customer that you understand that they're different, and that you are focused on making sure that you're meeting their requirements in the way that they expect them to be meted. So having that separate area in not only on your website, but in a lot of your messaging is very important. Also, word of mouth is, is holds true with government contracting just like it does with any other type of business development activity. And oftentimes, people that are new to government contracting say, well, I don't know anybody. Well, maybe you do and maybe you don't. Sometimes your best connections are through some of the professional relationships that you have. You never know who somebody knows. So oftentimes by reaching out to say your accountant or your lending institution, if you have a relationship with your bank or your bookkeeper or vendors or other teaming partners, people that businesses that you're a team with, and letting them know that you are now focused on generating business in the federal government market sector. You never know where that next referral is going to come from. So by spreading the word, you're increasing your chances. Also, one of the marketing tools that we strongly recommend that you develop for your company is a capabilities statement, or oftentimes it's referred to as a cap statement. Now, a cap statement or capability statement is basically a one or two page brief resume of your, of your company. Oftentimes it's requested by government agencies or prime contractors that are looking for subs. It is typically an overview of what you do, how you do it. It identifies your business codes, your uh, small business certifications, your DUNS number, your location. It will talk about your past performance. It will talk about what you are uh, exceptionally good at and essentially why should we do business with you. It is, a, it is a short leave behind or many times an introductory piece uh, that, again, is a uh, emphasizer of your company. It's a resume. And like resumes, capability statements generally won't win you the contract. However, a bad capability statement can sometimes cost you the opportunity. 
So we would encourage you to uh, put some time into this, work with your PTAC specialist, and to develop a very refined, uh, focused, and polished capability statement that presents your company in the most professional way possible. One of the other things that you can do in uh, preparing yourself for government contracting is to look at small business certifications that you may or may not be eligible for. Now, there are multiple certifications available in the federal uh, government contracting arena. So let's take uh, just a moment to discuss those. On the federal side, there's generally four mainstream uh, small business certifications that are, are administered and governed over by the SBA or Small Business Administration. And they include the 8A Small Disadvantaged Business Program, the Woman-Owned Small Business Program, the Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Business Program, and the Historically Underutilized Business Zone Certification. Those are the four primary uh, preferred small business certifications. And again, there's more information about those available through the SBA site, which is sba.gov. Also, your PTAC specialist is well-versed uh, and we can help you in uh, identifying those certifications and help you through the pathway to applying for those. Also, there's something called the uh, SDVOSB or Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Business Certification available through the VA Center for Verification. And that is a separate certification that is issued by the VA. The Department of Transportation also has something called a DBE certification or Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. Now, this is typically applied and is active for any vendors or contractors that want to do transportation-related contracts. That, of course, would be, for example, with the Florida Department of Transportation or any transportation-related entities such as uh, ports, um, airports, shipping ports, uh, and public transportation uh, as well as public utilities oftentimes will fall under DOT, um, uh, DBE certifications. And then finally, there's also third-party uh, certifiers that are also will issue small business certifications, and uh, those are wide and varied as well. So the question is frequently asked, well, which one is, should I go for? Uh, should I go for all of them? And it's a very commonly asked question. The answer, however, is uh, sometimes a little bit more complex. So uh, the first thing is, are you even eligible for it? Do you qualify? And uh, by going to the various sites, either the SBA, the VA, the Department of the Transportation, or third-party third party issuers, uh, that's going to provide you some guidance. Also, your PTAC specialist can help you uh, answer that question as well. But more importantly, uh, something that should be considered is, is it valued by the agency? Is it valued and is it applicable uh, by the agency itself? So, for example, for the VA, for any set-aside contract under the SDVOSB or the uh, just the regular VOSB or Veteran-Owned Small Business Certification. Uh, any contract that's set aside by the VA, it is required that that vendor uh, ha has received that certification through the VA system. Also, SBA, uh, for the various certifications, those are generally applicable across all federal agencies. And then, of course, the DOT certification is applicable to Department of Transportation-related activities. So it's going to be dependent on, one, your eligibility, and two, 
where you're focusing your business development activities. In other words, what agencies are you pursuing work with? And, of course, you would pursue the certification that is applicable to that agency. So this is a very uh, brief overview of small business certifications. If this is something you would like to discuss more, please bring it up as a topic of discussion with your PTAC specialist. So moving forward, we've evaluated the market. We've got a good, solid plan it's going to help us reach our goal. We've completed our mandatory registrations. We've got some good things prepared to optimize our chances of success. Now let's look at actually what all that has been done for, and that's pursuing an opportunity and ultimately winning, winning the work. So let's look at some of the procurement sites that you should consider in looking at solicitations. Now, this step is similar to what we did earlier, what I discussed earlier, and that's download a solicitation, take a look at it, become familiar with it. That was early in the evaluation stage. Now we're in the pursuit stage. Now we're actually going to download some active solicitations and take a look at what those requirements are and look at, at actually bidding on some work, uh, producing a proposal, submitting it, and going through the evaluation of our offer, and and uh, and hopefully receiving that contract award. So where do you find those? Well, right back to where we've been going all along this journey, and that is uh, starting at betasam.gov. That's a good place for finding uh, most federal government uh procurements uh, and, and RFPs uh, would recommend that you go there first. And one of the things to note here is that a lot of the things that we had done accomplished earlier in evaluating the market, in researching opportunities, in looking at requirements uh, for various agencies, th those are starting to gather momentum here for us. And that activity was not just research. It wasn't just um, identifying opportunities and agencies, but now we're developing knowledge and know-how in the use of that database so that now we're really effectively utilizing uh, the system, querying it correctly to identify viable opportunities for our business. So we're really kind of building our our procurement muscle there, if you will. Um, one of the other sites that you may want to consider looking at, especially if you provide uh, commodities, uh, you're going to want to look at the Defense Logistics Agency, or DLA site. And it's often called DIBS. Uh, a lot of commodity purchases uh, are, are purchased through the Defense Logistics Agency. As well as services, I don't want to diminish their need for services. There's there's also a high need for services, but you will see frequent uh, uh, posting of um, uh, various commodities and supplies as well. You may want to consider looking at a GSA schedule. Uh, and again, sort of the same story there as uh, DLA, you'll see a lot of commodities uh, purchased through GSA, although you will also see services as well. That may be something for you to consider. And then also there's something called the SAP. I had referred to it earlier. That's that mid-level purchase or simplified acquisition procedure. Those generally occur on two sites, FedConnect, which is at www.fedconnect.net, and the links are provided below underneath uh, the description here. Also, Unison uh, will conduct uh, many SAP acquisition activities as well. So if that's a threshold, as we discussed earlier, that you're interested in focusing in on, that's something that you identified in your marketing plan, then I would encourage you to take a look at um, uh, either Either one of those sites or both of them. You may want to monitor both of them, FedConnect and Unison Acquisition. Uh, 
So these are going to be your primary sites. And I've just got four listed here. There are literally thousands of various procurement sites where you can find contracting opportunities. However, these are uh, the mainstream uh, sites that I would recommend that you start with and then from there branching out. And again, it's all going to be dependent on your business, what you provide, and what your capabilities are. But start with betasam.gov. Once you're at Beta Sam, some of the things to be on the lookout for are, are first of all, you're going to want to register. You're going to want to create that username and account. And that is going to enable more features that you can utilize on the site, such as setting up uh, customized searches, saving uh, contracts for automatic notification, and uh, taking advantage of the full capability of, um, of that database. You're going to want to look at specifically contract opportunities. I would encourage you to utilize the full feature uh, uh, filters capability of the website. That's where you can really drill down into the opportunities by uh, NAICS code, by location, by say, set-aside type, if you're interested in just looking at, say, woman-owned small business um, opportunities, for example, or you're interested in just looking at certain opportunities from certain uh, branches of uh, the federal government. So again, let's say you're lo looking at focusing in on NASA, for example. You can filter those opportunities specifically by those agencies. Also, take a look at the announcements section on Beta Sam. That's where you'll see a lot of uh, uh, publicly uh, announced um, acquisition activities to include uh, uh, meetings, business expos, uh, industry days, uh, small business events, um, on and on and on. So uh, those announcements are always a good thing to sort of look at when you first visit the site. Uh, keep using those keywords, keep looking uh, in a combination of filters that would include your, your NAICS code, your location, your keywords, your set aside by using a combination of all those things. And again, it's going to be, each business is going to be different depending on your circumstances, but by using a combination of all those things in concert, it is going to help dial you in to the opportunities that are, are germane and applicable uh, to your business. So betasam.gov. And again, uh, I know that I keep saying it over and over, but it bears uh, being repeated. Get together with your PTAC specialist. Again, that's the purpose of this presentation is to prepare you for, for the first meeting and ongoing discussions with your PTAC specialist. Get with them, have them demonstrate the, uh, the use and utilization of this database. Uh, and the whole idea is so that we minimize the amount of time that we're, we're struggling with the technology, we're utilizing it efficiently to identify the opportunities, start bidding, and, uh, and receiving those contract awards. And your PTAC specialist can help you with that. All right, there's also subcontracting to consider. In, in federal contracting, many small businesses they get their first contract as a subcontractor, and that uh, does has multiple benefits. Uh, it uh, one, it's much more rapid uh, than uh, than sort of the traditional acquisition pathway. Many times you can uh, get yourself onto a subcontract very very quickly. Uh, it also minimizes your risk because um, you aren't necessarily answering directly to the government for the entire contract. You're simply servicing a small component of that contract, and ultimately the prime is responsible for the overall performance and, uh, and the complexity of the uh, obligation. So, uh, and it also provides um, the, the first-time small business the opportunity to build some past performance, to build some relationships, and to uh, hopefully watch how 
a large successful company does it. So where do you find these opportunities? There are many places to look. Uh, one of the places we recommend starting with is through the SBA subnet site. And again, that link is provided below. Also on betasam.gov, there is a section for um, any kind of collaboration activity. Usually at the very, very top of the banner, you'll see an option for clicking on collaboration. Many opportunities themselves uh, posted will advertise the opportunity for subcontracting. The SBA also publishes a directory of federal government prime contractors that have subcontracting plans. I would encourage you to visit that document and download it and look at prime contractors who are obligated to uh, subcontract. And then finally, every agency and generally most agency sites will have a small business specialist uh, stationed on site. And uh, that individual's a part of their duties are to uh, assist small businesses in, in onboarding with that agency. And many times they know other contractors that are supporting contracts on site and uh, they can provide um, information uh, to you and who those contractors are. So and I would encourage you to forge a relationship with those small business specialists. They can be uh, very beneficial to you. So earlier I had talked about all the various types of solicitations, but we're going to throw a slightly different light on it at this point because here we're actually submitting an offer. And again, there's all kind of different forms that that solicitation could take when it's posted to include an invitation to bid, a request for quote, a request for proposal, or an invitation to negotiate. Regardless of what it is, you need to make sure what you're submitting is fully compliant and you've substantiated your approach with the government. You need to make sure that it's delivered on time. All right? If it is, if the uh, if the RFP or the solicitation says that it's due at one o'clock on Tuesday, uh, and you come to deliver it at one o five. Uh, chances are the government will not accept it. So you need to make sure that when you're developing your offer that not only is it um, fully following the instructions of the solicitation uh, to include the when, it's, when and where it's delivered. So very important to generate those offers. Uh, there's no getting around this. It is a reality of doing business with the government, you know, any federal government agency is that you're going to have to at one point or another, develop a proposal and submit it. And uh, this is that stage. This is uh, primarily everything that has led up to this point in time has been preparing us for this so that we are not just uh, throwing together uh, some offer and hoping that uh, somehow it's going to win, but we're preparing our intelligence, our insight, our knowledge of the customer, our knowledge of the competition, uh, and preparing ourselves as best we can to optimize our chances of success so that when we submit an offer, it's accepted as uh, a successful offer and we're awarded the contract. An important part of that offer is going to be making sure that we meet all pass and fail requirements. And these are going to be uh, different according to the contract. By going back and looking at that solicitation, which by the way, the solicitation will eventually become the contract. Uh, so by looking at that solicitation, that will identify what are the um, pass-fail requirements that we're going to be obligated to to support and provide in our response. And that could include um, ISO certification. It could include an ITAR compliance or International Traffic and Arms Regulations compliance. It could include compliance with a cybersecurity model certification, which is becoming an increasing requirement across the, all 
government contracting sectors. It could be compliance with past performance requirements. Say, for example, the uh, solicitation may require you to provide five contracts within the past three years of comparable size, scope, and complexity with uh, the the contract that you're offering on. Uh, it could be uh, the requirement for uh, certified and experienced personnel and key personnel, on and on and on to include insurance and bonding. So again, each one is going to be different where you're going to find the answers to what's required is by going back to that solicitation. Also, one of the requirements that uh, you're going to often encounter is the uh, the need to provide a compliant accounting system. If the federal government does one thing, they watch um, the accounting of expenditures and funds very, very closely. And that um, is, uh, is, of course, scrutinized very closely under um, all its vendors. You will uh, most likely encounter... Um, an agency called DCAA, or the Defense Contract Audit Agency. Uh, Sometimes you may encounter the Defense Contract Management Agency, or DCMA. Uh, Both of those organizations generally have some role uh, in in doing an audit of a contractor's accounting system. Uh, The federal government requires uh, its contractors to have an accrual based um, accounting uh, system. And uh, finally, um, one of the requirements uh, that is uh, oftentimes uh, of all contracts is uh, usage of they call the IRAP or uh, WAWF, uh, Wide Area Workflow System. And these systems uh, are what you're going to utilize uh, to submit your vouchers or, or submit your invoices and um, in order to get paid. So um, an understanding and how to use those is important if at the end of the day um, you get done with the contract and you want to get paid, you need to make sure that you have the ability to submit uh, your invoice correctly uh, in order to expedite your payment. So uh, again, all these are something that your PTAC specialist can help you with. So um, one of the last things that I want to touch on here in the um, in the pursuit phase or producing a proposal, uh, and this has worked well for me over the years, um, and I call it my three C's. Um, and uh, uh, there, there are other acronyms for this. I've heard it called the five, the five P's, uh, the, the, the four S's, but the basic idea is the same. And that is uh, to consider three things when submitting your proposal. Uh, the first one is, is it compliant? Am I meeting all the requirements of the uh, solicitation? Uh, has it asked me for uh, five contracts in the last three years? Uh, and have I provided that? Has it asked me uh, for resumes of key personnel? Have I provided that? Uh, has it asked me for my uh, proof of insurance and bonding? And uh, have I provided that? So that's the first thing. Is it compliant? That's the first of the three C's. Uh, The second one is, is it clear? In other words, is it clear to understand? Do, uh, for for somebody who is just opening my proposal for the first time and they've never seen it, uh, does it make sense? Does it read well? Uh, Does it portray my company professionally? Does it follow the instructions of the RFP in a clear and logical way? Or am I jumping all over the place and and I'm asking, um, I'm answering the first question uh, last and I'm asking, answering the the last question first and and is it difficult for the government evaluator to follow? So is it clear? And then finally, the last C is, uh, is my proposal compelling? Does it uh, give good reason uh, for the evaluator to award this contract to me? And so those are my three C's for submitting uh, any proposal uh, to any government agency. Is it compliant? Is it clear? And is it compelling? And that's a good system to consider uh, before, uh, when, when preparing your proposal and before submitting 
your offer to the government. Now that brings us to the last step of our Florida six-step gateway to government contracts, and that's actually achieving a favorable result, being awarded the contract. So let's take a look at what's entailed there. So first of all, when you're supporting your contract, you want to make sure that you're operating within the rules. And we've touched on this several times in the course of this um, webinar. And uh, of course, those are things like your um, Code of Federal Regulations or CFRs and your Federal Acquisition Regulations or FAR. Uh, you also want to comply with any executive orders that may be uh, in place that are, um, uh, uh, that are over uh, any government contracts that you're supporting. The, and then we go down to the uh, agency supplements, such as the DFARs or GSARs, uh, and then individual service regulations um, and individual office policies. So it can go on and on and on. Uh, the point of this is not necessarily to overwhelm you and, and to say that uh, it, there, it, it's just overly complex. It is complex. I don't want to um, uh, diminish that in any way. However, uh, you don't necessarily um, need to be over uh, – you want, don't want to be discouraged by, by all that. You want to uh, be organized, understand what they are, understand how they're applicable – and most of all, you want to be compliant because we've gone through this long journey together. We've, we've identified our agency. We've submitted our offer. We've got our small business certifications. We've done all these. Uh, we've, we've done our registrations. Uh, when we win the contract, we don't want to lose it. So uh, we need to make sure that we're compliant with, with, with all these requirements. A good place to start is in the Federal Acquisition Regulation Section 9.104. Dash one. I would encourage you to take a look at that section. It's a it's a good uh, section of the FAR that identifies what's required of those prime contractors, and so it discusses things like having adequate financial resources. It discusses things like having the necessary necessary organizational experience and accounting operational controls and technical skills and having property control systems and things of that nature. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that section, um, maybe even making it part of your evaluation uh, step in the, in the very beginning of this contracting journey, because it will be required of you downstream when you're awarded a contract. So better be, uh, it's better to be re uh, prepared for this in the beginning uh, rather than scrambling uh, to be compliant uh, at the end. So I had discussed a little earlier, I had, I had talked a little bit about DCAA and DCMA. Um, be prepared for a pre-award survey um, and or a contract audit. Uh, this will frequently happen with in doing business with federal government agency. That agency is going to uh, many times request that the contractor is audited to ensure that their accounting systems are correct, that they're, they're properly allocating their costs to the contract, that their billing rates are correct, and that uh, generally uh, their accounting systems are compliant with federal requirements. There's quite a bit of information that's available on the DCAA site. Uh, again, you can find the link to all that information below. Uh, but be prepared for it. Um, it. It is something that you're going to need to be again organized about, and uh, you're definitely want to uh, going to want to be prepared for and not scrambling at the last minute. Reporting requirements, very important with federal contracting. There'll be a myriad of reports that will be required of you. Going back to the solicitation uh, slash contract, again, the solicitation will become the contract. So by going back to that document and looking at what the reporting requirements are, are going to tell you what you're obligated to do in performance. So things like timekeeping, uh, your cybersecurity plan, yeah, invoicing, uh, 
any kind of standards like that are all going to be identified uh, in that solicitation and what's required of you. And it goes on and on. Uh, contracts are like fingerprints. No two are created the same. And uh, even within one agency with similar contracting activities, you'll see variations from contract to contract. So very, very important to make sure that you're reviewing that. Ultimately, your contract is derived from the um, applicable federal acquisition regulations, which are going to be the, the FAR and your various service regulations and command regulations. So it's going to be a combination of your regulations, uh, the solicitation, any amendments that are issued uh, during the course of the acquisition activity, and your proposal. If you've promised certain things in your proposal that, say, are above and beyond what they're asking for, that will be incorporated into your contract. So that's what your contract is, is a combination of the regulations, solicitation, amendments, and your proposal. Um, so make sure that you are complying with everything that uh, they are asking for. So now we talk about actually performing the work, doing what we're supposed to be doing, providing the service or goods. Now you'll notice up until this point, I've said very little about the actual functional elements of the contract. We've talked a lot about regulations and then the process and certifications and registrations and, and uh, all those types of elements. Um, and that is really a large part of government contracting is the administration of the contract itself and, and operating within, uh, within the, those boundaries. So uh, now that is not to diminish at all the importance of doing the work, uh, doing what we promised that we would do. Uh, as established, successful small businesses, you should know your work. You should know how to provide that service or to deliver those goods, how to do it uh, on time, to, to deliver at a level of satisfaction that the government, uh, that the uh, customer is expecting, uh, to do it within budget uh, and schedule and so forth. So um, that's your expertise. That's what you should be doing really, really well. And you want to continue doing that and making sure that you're fulfilling uh, what the contract is asking for. And it's really those two things in tandem. It's uh, not only meeting the contractual obligations, but it's meeting the performance requirements of that agency and doing both of those uh, functions equally as well and, uh, and meeting uh, customer needs. So um, that is um, paramount to your ability to uh, do several things. One, win the initial contract win the recompete uh, and grow your business in government contracting because winning the first one is the most difficult one. And after you've won that, you want to win more. And uh, by doing uh, these two things um, very, very well and uh, paying attention to, um, to uh, uh, both of these things simultaneously is going to uh, improve your um, success rate and uh, your, your level of um, growth in government contracting. So uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation. One of the things that I want to emphasize here uh, as we close up is, uh, first of all, congratulations on sticking around this long. Uh, everything that, that we've addressed today, all the topics, all the questions, all the subject matter, all the issues, uh, there's nothing that we touched on that the Florida Procurement Technical Assistance Center program cannot help you with. Uh, these are the services that we support Florida businesses with day in and day out. And I should mention that our services are available to you, uh, a Florida business, at no cost. So what I would encourage you to engage with your local PTAC, whether you're a uh, looking to pursue work as a prime contractor or a subcontractor, as long as you have the commitment and interest and potential, uh, reach out to your PTAC specialist and connect with them 
Uh, it's a it's a relationship that can help you uh, more rapidly um, win that first contract and ultimately grow and succeed in the in the uh, realm of government contracting. So, in preparing for that first meeting, what are some things that you can do? One of the things that that we recommend is in that first uh, stage of evaluation, go ahead and download a solicitation before your first meeting. Take a look at it. It's going to, as I had mentioned earlier, it's going to be overwhelming. It's going to be a little foreign to, to you if you've never looked at one of these before. And that's okay because what it's going to do is it's going to invigorate that discussion with your PTAC specialist. It's going to create some very focused questions for you about specific things with the agency, with the contract, with the process of building business with the government. Um, if you can, go ahead and apply for your DUNS number. Uh, uh, moving forward with your username and password on your SAM registration would be a good thing to do as well. But really, the number one thing that you can do is bring your questions to that meet, first meeting with your PTAC specialist. And where do you find that pre- person? By visiting the website here in Florida, which is www.f ptac.org. There'll be a, a area on the site for locations. Click on the PTAC specialist that is closest to where you are and uh, schedule an appointment. So if you're ready for government contracts, again, I would encourage you to visit us online, connect with us. I'd like to add that this Procurement Technical Assistance Center or PTAC is funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the Defense Logistics Agency. I'd like to thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day, and we look forward to meeting with you. Thank you.